Okay, hello. I say hello to everyone who is watching this next week. Welcome to Parashat Vayigash. Well, we left off a, on a clinghanger, a cliffhanger at the end of last week's uh, Sedra. Yosef threatened to keep Binyamin as a slave after he discovered, so to speak, Yosef's goblet had been found in Binyamin's sack. And Yehuda began to try to persuade Yosef not to enslave Binyamin. That's how we ended last week. Now, at the beginning of our parasha, Yehuda continues to plead with Yosef. And there's a powerful scene in which he explains to Yosef how Yaakov had lost his son Yosef and that he would not be able to bear losing Binyamin as well. And Yosef finds the situation all too emotional. He sends all the servants out of the room and he bursts into tears. And he then reveals his true identity. He is Yosef, their long lost brother. Yosef assures the brothers he doesn't bear a grudge against them for what they did to him. He understands that it was all part of God's plan. And he instructs the brothers to go and bring their father to Egypt. And then he then embraces his brother Binyamin. Yaakov is told what happened. He can hardly believe it, but eventually he realizes that it's the truth and he prepares to go to Egypt. And God appears to Yaakov and tells him not to be afraid to go to Egypt. He tells him that Yaakov uh, should, should go there with his family. He goes there with his whole family. They make their way to the land of Egypt and Yosef and Yaakov have an emotional reunion. And Yosef arranges an area called Goshen for his family to live in. Just stop to let some people in <clears throat> and we'll move into some inspirational insights on our parasha. So first of all, we look back and we see the stories of the Torah so far as we're starting to draw towards the end. Next week will be the end of the book of Bereshit. And there are so many problems that come up in the family. We think back a good number of weeks ago to the story of Lot, in which Lot is prepared to allow his own daughters to be raped rather than allowing his guests to be harmed by the people of Sodom. A completely palpably disgraceful overlooking of the value of family. And what we read there on is repeated problems in the family. Obviously, actually, even from the very outset of the Torah, Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, Rachel and Leah, Joseph and his brothers, the conflicts involving Laban, particularly with Jacob. Again and again, we encounter these conflicts, conflicts between husband and wife as well. And it's this week's parasha which really highlights to us on the positive side, the importance of family solidarity. It's interesting that in last week's parasha, we read the rebuke given by Reuben to the other brothers. Who, and Reuben says to them, I told you not to sin with the boy. And as when, when the brothers realize that they are being punished for what they had done all those years earlier, Reuben says it's because you sinned with the boy. Well, they did sin with the boy, but he's putting it in a very impersonal way by describing their own brother, their own flesh and blood, whom they sold as being the boy. What we encounter in this week's parasha are the powerful words, though, of Yehuda. And when Yehuda speaks and he stands up for Binyamin and he says, take me as a slave and allow Binyamin to go, Yehuda is not merely talking about technical moral behavior, right and wrong. He's talking about the passion of family commitments. He's talking about how much he feels for his father, the pain that his father would have to go through in losing Binyamin. What we encounter is the energy and the language of family love. And indeed, when Yosef reveals himself to his brothers, he says to them twice, Ani Yosef. The second time he says, Ani Yosef, Achichem, I am Yosef, your brother. And the Orachayim commentary says that in, in repeating himself, Yosef was addressing two doubts. The first doubt that the brothers might have was, was he really Yosef? But the second doubt they would have was, even if he is Yosef, is he going to deal with us as a loving brother? Is he going to deal with us with brotherly love 
And so Yosef repeats and he says, I am Yosef, your brother. Not only am I Yosef, but you can be assured that despite what you did to me, I will behave to you with the love of a brother. We mentioned that Yaakov makes his plan to go down to Egypt. And before he does so, God reveals himself to Yaakov and says, don't be afraid. Because I will go down with you to Egypt and I will bring you up again. Well, maybe the first half of that makes sense. Indeed, the idea that God went with Yaakov and his family to Egypt. But what does it mean? I will bring you up again. We know that Yaakov, in his lifetime at least, does not get brought up from Egypt. He dies in Egypt. Yes, he's buried there later. That's his body. But he dies in Egypt. And the commentaries explain that when God says to Yaakov, I will bring you up, he is referring to the hundreds, the thousands of Hebrews, Yaakov's descendants, whom God would bring out of Egypt and eventually bring to the promised land centuries later. And so it emerges that when God says to Yaakov, you, I will bring you up, he's not talking to Yaakov that in terms of his physical life. Yaakov in his own life will die in Egypt. He's saying, Yaakov, if you want to really know who you are, you can't just define yourself by your own lifespan because your story continues through the future generations of your family. And so I will bring your family back. And even though you in your own lifetime will not come back to this land, you will know that you are part of a story and part of that future story will be coming back to the land. What Yaakov is being taught here by God is the importance of feeling a closeness to the future, to the future of our family and our people, that which will continue even after we're no longer here physically, just as much as we are also deeply connected to our past, to the previous generations. There's a wonderful story about David Ben-Gurion, who in the mid-1940s was offered by the British a small state of Israel, much smaller than that which had been promised by Lord Balfour. And Ben-Gurion had to make the decision, shall I accept this because otherwise maybe I'll get nothing? Or shall I fight it? Shall I say no and hold out for something which is more respectable? And Ben-Gurion had an advisor called Yitzhak Tabenkin. And Tabenkin says, I have to go and consult with some people, Ben-Gurion, before giving you my advice. And the next day, Tabenkin comes back and he says, my advice is that you shall not accept this offer from the British. And Ben-Gurion says, I will take your advice, but please tell me, whom did you, with whom did you consult? And Tabenkin says, I consulted with my grandfather and my grandson. My grandfather, who died 10 years ago, and my grandson, who is not yet born. In other words, Tabenkin was a person with a deep sense of history. Even though his grandfather was no longer living, he was still able to look back to his grandfather and ask, what would my grandfather want me to do? Looking ahead to my life, looking ahead to the future generations, how can I make sure I'm not letting him down? And even though my grandson is not yet born, I know that my grandson will be affected by the results of what's being decided today. And so what is my grandson saying to me about what kind of world he wants me to create? That is what it is to be a Jew, to live with history, with a deep connection to the past and the future. And that is the message that God is teaching Yaakov. And so we see that in the lives of Yehuda and Yosef, we see these values of the importance of love for the family, devotion, Yehuda's deep love and compassion for his father, Yosef's ability to have brotherly love for his brothers who treated him that way. And we see that what God tells Yaakov is to expand, expand that beyond, not only to love the family members who are alive today, not only to maintain our connection with family members who are no longer alive, but also to realize the future of our family, the next generation are also part of our story. And when we daven, when we say our prayers, when we learn something about Judaism, when we do good deeds, we should understand that we are part of the Jewish story, that we've inherited these beautiful prayers, Torah ideas and mitzvot from earlier generations. And so too, we are part of that process of passing them on to the later generations. I'm just gonna to stop to let a couple of people in. So let's reflect a little bit more on Yehuda. And for those who are, in, who are going to be in synagogue tomorrow, this is a little bit of a prelude. 
if you are reading the last third of the book of Bereshit, these last few parshas, one thing should be very, very clear. And that is that Yosef is going to emerge as a leader. But the least likely person in this story to emerge as one of the great leaders is Yehuda. Yehuda was the one a couple of weeks ago in Parsha the Yeshev who proposed selling Yosef in the first place. Shortly thereafter, he separates from his brothers. He intermarries. He loses two of his sons because of sin. And then there is that scene with a problematic relationship with his daughter-in-law who dresses up as a harlot and they have relationships together. The Torah describes that Yehuda went down from among his brothers and the commentators say, what does it mean he went down? It's talking about a moral decline. This is a very unlikely hero of the Jewish people. And so who are we, are we descended from? And who are we named after? Who has the greater legacy, Yosef or Yehuda? Yosef had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and they became two of the tribes. But the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh disappeared from the pages of history after the land was conquered. Who are the descendants of Yehuda? The descendants of Yehuda were the kings. King David was a descendant of Yehuda. And indeed, we Jews are, what's Jews in Hebrew? Yehudim. We are named after Yehuda. Our religion, Judaism, is Judaism. We are named after Judah. Not all of us are descended from him. Some of us are Kohanim, descended from Levi. Some of us are from the tribe of Binyamin. And yet, nevertheless, whichever of the brothers we descended from, we are all called Jews. How did that happen, that we became named after a person who had done such bad things? And the answer lies in Judaism's insistence that, yes, Human beings sin. That's what happens. We do. But there's hope for turning things around. And Yehuda is the greatest expression of that. In this week's parasha, that same Yehuda who did all the things that I described stands up before the viceroy of Egypt and says, I am going to guarantee the safety of my brother Binyamin. And he takes personal responsibility. And he is willing to give up his own freedom. Yehuda is the first person in the Torah whom we encounter who does perfect repentance, who turns around from doing things which are very bad and becomes a hero. The first step which is necessary to do that is to be able to say, I was wrong. It's often pointed out, I think I may have mentioned in a sermon a few weeks ago, that, uh, that the name Yehuda is, is related to the word hoda, meaning thanks. Yehuda's mother, Leah, calls him Yehuda because she wants to give thanks to God. But that word and that Hebrew root is also related to the word lehit vadot, lehit vadot, which means to confess. Yehuda is a person who has the capacity to confess when he wrongs his daughter-in-law, when he says that his daughter-in-law should be burnt alive, she should be put to death because she was a prostitute and she became impregnated. His daughter-in-law sends a message to him which shows him very clearly that he was the one who had impregnated her, and Yehuda turns around and says, she is more righteous than I am. The ability to admit that we are wrong is a fundamental step along the path to becoming a Yehuda, not a person who never does anything wrong, but a person who's able to recognize what he or she has done wrong and turn it around and then proceed on the journey to greatness. And it is that hero after whom we, as Jews, are named. One more idea that I'll share, which, which uh, relates to Yaakov's meeting with Pharaoh. At the beginning of next week's parasha, the beginning of Vayachi, the Torah says that the time approached for Yisrael, that is Yaakov, to die. And whenever that phraseology is used, it always indicates that the person who died, the person who's being spoken of as dying, died at a younger age than his father had died. And indeed, Yaakov passed away at the age of 147, which was 33 years younger 
than Yitzchak, Yaakov's father, when he died. And the sages interpret that loss of 33 years as a punishment for how Yaakov answers Pharaoh's question in this week's parsha. Pharaoh says to Yaakov, how old are you? And Yaakov responds with a seeming complaint about how short and full of suffering his life had been. The late Rabbi Noach Weinberg, the head of the Eish Torah Yeshiva, points out that actually in Yaakov's reply, there are only 25 words. It's only if you count the words of Pharaoh's question as well, that you get to in that conversation a total of 33 years, corresponding to the 33, sorry, 33 words, corresponding to the 33 years taken off Yaakov's life. And so the indication would be that Yaakov is not only being punished for his answer to Pharaoh, but somehow he's also being punished for Pharaoh's question. Why should Yaakov have been punished for Pharaoh's question? Rabbi Weinberg answered, do you think that the first question that Pharaoh had been planning to ask Yaakov was how old are you? Surely not. He must have had so many other questions. How did you manage to raise a son like Yosef, who saved all of Egypt with his brilliance? How did you raise such sons as the rest of the tribes, these other sons? But then Pharaoh saw the way in which Yaakov looked, the way he carried himself, forlorn, not happy, and he couldn't help himself from blurting out, how old are you? And for that question, Yaakov was punished. Because as Rabbi Weinberg taught, a Jew must always strive to radiate happiness. A Jew must always try to rejoice in the gift of life that God has given us, not to carry oneself in a way which exudes the vibrations of sadness and forlornness. I had no idea if that last word I said was a real word. Please forgive me. Okay, I want to wish you all a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for joining us today. And just to, re to review the ideas that we've learned together, the power of, of inspiration from Yehuda, who shows the capacity to turn around from a life of error to a life of virtue. The importance of family love and connection, not only to family alive today, but even to family not yet born. And carry ourselves with a sense of joy. Wishing Shabbat Shalom to Nettie, nice to see you. To Steve, you told me you'd see me in a few hours, but here you are already. To Carol and to Vivian, to Warren and Erica, sorry, uh, Warren and Erica, you knew the last, the last uh, minute there. And to Diana, wishing you all a Shabbat Shalom.